we want to thank Viviani that she made a very good job putting this meeting together and we are very, very happy to have all of you here. I just want to give you a quick look of what the activities that we have so far prepared for you from Congenital Heart Academy. So we have webinars big, big as this one uh, every Thursday and the same time. So the next one is going to be ECMO part one, then we are going to have interventions, then we are going to have the TGA part two, the first one was amazing, and then we are going to have ECMO part two. And if you want to take a look on the previous webinars, please uh, go to our YouTube channel. I'm going to place the links of all, all these activities and uh, uh, the YouTube channel on the chat uh, in a moment. So for the next week, we have on Monday, a classroom with Dr. Silverman to talk about morphology and images uh, on the common arterial trunk. It's going to be very interesting. It's going to be a little bit later, one hour later than this uh, Thursday's meetings. And this is really worth, uh, worth watching. It's going to be one of our uh, webinar. And we, in, we are and together, uh, all of these societies uh, join, uh, join the uh, Children's National and in this COVID uh, CICU response, uh, we have meetings every Tuesday night, being very, very nice. And so we invite you for the next one next Tuesday. I'm going to place the email for a subscription for registration on the chat as well. And then next Thursday, on the same time, we are going to have a very nice talk about the WECMO and we invite all of you to participate. And on Friday, we are going to have a morphology classroom uh, with Dr. Anderson. We are going to talk about uh, ASD. Uh, so we have delegates from all around the world. We want to get to uh, every place. So please join us. The email is here and I'm going to place on the chat as well. So uh, write to us if you want to be a delegate, if you want to help us to spread the news on your country, on uh, your place, and if you want to help us uh, uh, to get better uh, as well. So now I'm going to give the word to Viviani and thank again um, the Congenital Cardiac Anesthesia Society uh, for being with us uh, today. And Viviani, thank you very much. And I hope everybody enjoys uh, uh, this meeting. Thank you, Grace. Thanks, Sasha. Thank you, Rosanna. <laughs> it would have been way nicer maybe to be all together, but this is great. We have so many uh, people registered and uh, we can hear from everyone all over the world. Uh, so the sessions today are going to be mostly focused on anesthesia, but I think since we are talking about pre-op, intra-op, post-op, I think it covers even everyone's interest in terms of cardiology, surgery, and the care for our patients with congenital heart disease. Uh, the first session is going to be about the operating room and what everyone needs to know. Uh, this is focused on updates, so most talks are 10 minutes and telling us about the most recent uh, in the field. Um, as you can see, the speakers, I'm going to take their 10 minutes to present them if I have to present them. So I'm going to make it brief and give a few sentences about each one. The first one we're starting with is um, Dr. David Ferroni. So David is originally from Belgium. Uh, he did his training there, worked there at the uh, Queen Fabiola Children's Hospital. Uh, we got the chance to meet David when he came to Boston Children for two years as a visiting assistant professor. And then he left us and went to uh, sick kids uh, as, uh, in uh, at University of Toronto in Canada, where he is right now practicing as pediatric cardiac anesthesiologist, and he's also part of the research institute. Uh, David is well published. He's an editor of major journals, and I'm gonna let you, David, go ahead with your talk. Thank you, Vivian, for the very kind introduction, and I really would like to thank the organizing committee for having me this morning or afternoon or night. Uh, it's a very privilege to be here to talk to you about a really interesting topic that I really like, which is based blood management in cardiac anesthesia. And I'm going to focus this morning on what's new. I have no disclosures. Um, and the goal this morning uh, is really to tell you uh, what's new in the literature and also to identify the many areas where um, more studies are uh, needed. So I think when I think of blood management in 2020, and I think of what's new, um, I think that the, the, it's really hard now to believe that giving a lot of products, a little bit of everything coming off bypass is the way to go. 
and I hope that now and moving forward, we will uh, make efforts to actually go towards a targeted therapy. So if you look on the right hand side there, uh, you see the simplified model of, of, of coagulation. And I usually summarize the way to treat coagulopathy in four different boxes that you can see uh, as platelets and everything around the platelets. And I, I'm talking about the Van Willebrand factor as well, the fibrin and the fibrinogen, uh, the thrombin uh, in blue, and finally fibrinolysis uh, and the use of either tranexamic acid or uh, upsilon you know, capric acid. I'm not gonna talk about the last one today because I don't have time and I'm gonna spend the last uh, nine minutes on the three uh, other uh, options. So when it comes to platelets, uh, one interest of mine uh, and my research program now at SickKids is actually to look at platelet function and actually platelet dysfunction uh, during and after cardiopulmonary bypass and understand what are the risk factors, but also understand what the therapy that we're giving are doing on not only the platelet count, but the platelet function. And that's an example of an ongoing study that hopefully will be finished soon after COVID uh, to actually look at uh, changes over time and understand when we give allogenic platelets coming from the blood bank, what is it doing for the platelet count, but what is it doing for the platelet function? With the idea that what we're doing as a therapy might increase the number, but not really the function and might not be helping us that much in the OR when the patient is bleeding. So as you know, we don't really have alternative to allogenic platelets these days, and I'm hope that it will change in the near future. And I'm sure for those of you interested in trauma or a massive bleeding protocol, you know that some others are now trying to use cold or cryopreserved platelets, which is kind of shocking in, when you think about it because those platelets are far from being normal platelets stored like we used to. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter because when you have a massively bleeding patient, what you want to see is patients, uh, platelets that are sticking, that are working, and are, are giving you a strong clot. So those platelets might be a good option for cardiac patients. Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done before it can go to a, to a in vivo phase, but I think this is a, probably an interesting option when it comes to the platelet work. The one word that is coming uh, our way, and um, I really mentioned uh, the, the, the work done by Ashley Brown down in South Carolina. She's doing a lot of work with Nina Guzzetta and Laura Downey on trying to understand the fiber network in, in pediatric cardiac patients. And this is a very recent paper where Ashley is trying actually to uh, find some platelet-like particles that could be used to uh, improve the fiber network. And finally, I'm not very, familiar with the fresh whole blood because I've never really worked in a country uh, where fresh whole blood was used. But maybe the only benefit of having fresh whole blood is actually that this blood is contained, is, is, in, is the platelets are included in the blood. And the only way to actually understand how it works might maybe to have a look at the platelet function is in those bags instead of the allergenic blood. So lots of work to be done in the platelet world and we far from having any of those available clinically. Uh, when it comes to fibrinogen, we have way more data now than we used to have. Uh, I grew up in Europe where fibrinogen concentrate was, was a big thing already 10 years ago. Uh, this is a very recent paper published by Kevin Carcuti in Toronto and Canada and his group uh, looking at fibrinogen concentrate versus cryoprecipitate in, in, in adult cardiac patients and showing in this study that cryoprecipitate uh, and fibrinogen concentrate are pretty much equal when it comes to improving fibrinogen and, and having an effect on bleeding. Um, obviously, we don't have that uh, many large studies in the pediatric world, but this is a very interesting one published very recently in ANA by Laura Downey from, from Atlanta in a two-center study with Atlanta and, and Stanford, looking at the same idea of using fibrinogen concentrate or cryoprecipitate to improve fibrinogen uh, in bleeding patient and showing you that uh, cryoprecipitate and fibrinogen are pretty equal. So I think we can keep repeating those studies over and over. And, and what we'll find is probably that the fibrinogen, fibrinogen concentrate in terms of efficacy is pretty close to what you will find with cryoprecipitate. But in my opinion, if we, if we get to a really large number of patients, eventually we'll see that the fibrinogen concentrate might be a little bit superior to cryoprecipitate when it comes to safety. And we can always see the glass half empty or half full uh, it, it's not clear that all the factors, other factors uh, uh, that we find in cryoprecipitate are needed or actually are not, might not be needed for every single patient that uh, we are treating with cryoprecipitate. So having a targeted approach here is also something that is very important. 
So one of my favorite work that is really, really recent and, and really ma amazing is, is coming from Atlanta, as I said, with Nina, Laura Downey, and also uh, Laura, uh, Ashley Brown uh, Lab in South Carolina. And they're actually trying to understand the fiber network and the clot formation in, in neonates during and after cardiopulmonary bypass. And they showed us very important things here, showing that when you give adult fibrinogen from cardioprecipitate, it might not work very well and might not give you a very strong network uh, when you, you try to bind it with, with neonate, neonatal fibrin. And therefore, that might not be the best option when it comes to uh, improving your clot formation and your clot structures in those patients. And, and what they're doing now is to trying to do the same thing with fibrinogen concentrate and see if this fibrinogen white will, will, will stick better to the neonatal fibrin. But they also have done some pretty interesting work, work on using other alternatives like FIBA, so uh, four-factor PCC with activated 7A, or factor 7A, or four-factor PCC alone to actually try to see if the burst in thrombin generation that you, that you can get by using those agents will help you with restoring a very strong and, and, and nice fiber network. So the next step uh, might be uh, looking at PCC or FIBA or, or those, uh, those uh, agents as an alternative to factor 7A. Uh, Jim Dinardo and I did some work on fibrinogen on, on factor 7A back when I was in Boston looking at the incidence of thrombosis. And obviously the, the use of factor 7 will uh, increase the risk of thrombosis significantly. This might be a slightly, slightly bit better with, with PCC, but again, this needs to be studied uh, in large uh, pediatric uh, population. When I was in the adult world, I was interested in the, the world of DOACs and those are DOA, direct oral anticoagulants where the PCC was actually the only option we had back in the days to treat the coagulopathy in those patients. And the one thing I will show you is, is, is as a reminder that everything we do uh, and we treat the patient have an impact not only for a few hours, but for a long time. And when you see, when you give four-factor PCC or three-factor PCC in those patients, you increase your generation not only for five, six hours, but at least up to 24, 28 hours, which again, when you think of our cardiac population where there is obviously a risk of bleeding intraoperatively, but those patients are also the patients that will have a risk of thrombosis the next day or the following days. So really keep in mind that we, when we treat the patient, it has an impact on intraoperative, intraoperatively, but also has an impact in, in, in the midterm. And that's something that needs to be studied in terms of safety as well. So this is the bleeding algorithm that I kind of designed for, for, for Sick Kids Toronto. I wish I could tell you that everybody is using it, but I don't think it's the case yet. But this is how I see my, my bleeding algorithm uh, in those patients. And I, I see I have a European touch here with the with the Rotem as, uh, as a tool to help me in the OR to guide my therapy. And this algorithm has changed over the, over the years with, with here now fibrinogen concentrate instead of cryo and also the four factor PCC that is appearing. Uh, this needs uh, to be studied more, but it's a tool that you can use to treat uh, bleeding. So in conclusion, bleeding management is, is challenging as you know, uh, and there are still a lot of work that need to be done just because we don't understand every aspects yet. One thing that I always say is more is not always better and replacing the neonatal blood with a lot of adult stored blood might not be the best option in restoring uh, coagulation. And I think as you can see in the literature, there's still a lot of gaps and I think it's time for us to sit down together and try to put some collaborative efforts to fill those gaps. So again, thank you very much. Uh, and I will answer uh, the questions in the chat for the Q and A's later. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask you, David, to stop sharing. And uh, Mirella, if you want to start sharing your uh, slide. Uh, meanwhile, I invite all the participants, if you want to write your questions in the Q&A and uh, related for, to the first topic or to other topics, and we will do our best to answer them as we go through the webinar today. So Dr. Mirella Bourgeon, she uh, has uh, trained in France uh, for both anesthesiology and the intensive care. Um, uh, and she works currently at the Department of Anesthesiology and the Congenital Cardiac Unit at Marie Lanoulong uh, Hospital in France. Her uh, research is focused on bypass management, perfusion and kidney injury, as well as pharmacokinetics and antibiotics. Uh, Dr. Bourgeon, Mirella, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very honored. I have, oh, what's going on? 
Let's just. We can see your screen. Yeah, I, I just cannot. The slides are not. Okay, I have no disclosure. So lately, the, um, the, the number of patients who survive with very, very severe cardiac diseases are, is increasing. And though they arrive to the age where they need surgery, and lots of them, 40% of infants, but up to 60% of neonates will require some, uh, will develop kidney disease and will require some, some special treatment. So the problem with kidney disease, it has a very uh, big impact on postoperative um, uh, outcomes, either post immediate postoperative, but also fi a five year follow up with some of them already presenting signs of kid chronic kidney injury later in, during the life during life so this is a, a real problem today um, the, um, the acute disease quality initiative group had uh, an update in 2018 they uh, highlighted the fact that we have very little ability to predict which patients will develop kidney injury that we don't really have a reliable methods to monitor kidney during the operation and that we have unfortunately no effective intervention once kidney disease has been diagnosed. And indeed, the largest court, American court only was able to um, identify two risk factors for kidney disease in children age and the duration of bypass. And unfortunately, there's not much to do. Um, this um, uh, conference, consensus conference also highlighted and acknowledge the fact that um, cardiac surgery related kidney injury is a disease of the medulla and not of the cortex of the, of the kidney and is a result of the proximal tuber ischemia, reperfusion and toxicity. Now venous congestion is also a risk factor for um, kidney disease, but during bypass, we don't normally have venous congestion. This usually uh, arrives after the, after the bypass. So I, I won't, I won't uh, speak about this. So under normal conditions, the cortex of the kidney has no problem of oxygenation. There's a lot of blood arriving there and there's very little oxygen being consumed in the cortical area. However, deeper we go into the kidney, less blood there is and more oxygen consumption there is. The inner medulla, does not use oxygen almost at all. It is used to work during anaerobic conditions. The problem is the outer medulla, where the blood flow is low, the oxygen content is low. However, it's striking to see that this is an area where 90% of the oxygen consumed in the kidney will be used. So this is the most fragile area of the kidney. So experimental data shows us that the, the kid, uh, during the cardiac surgery related king injury we have renal vascular constriction with medullary hypoxia. We have uh, lesions of the tube, tubes of the epithelial cells of the proximal tubes, and we have a, a very low availability of nitric oxide. There is a decrease in renal blood flow and of uh, glomerular filtration rate, and there's also a decrease of salt reabsorption, which normally should make a balance between the two, so there shouldn't be a problem. The problem is, that the epithelial cell, which reabsorbs the salt, will use more energy because it is in, in jury. So in fact, the renal consumption of oxygen will not decrease, although the renal, the, the oxygen delivery will decrease. So there will be a big imbalance between oxygen and delivery and consumption. So there will be an increase in oxygen uh, extraction in the, in the kidney. So the first, the first attempt, which has been quite recently made, to try to find a balance between these was to, 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 to direct the perfusion according to a goal, which is oxygen delivery. So since our saturation is also always 100% on bypass, this comes back to say, we have to ensure a plot, pump flow and a good hematocrit. And indeed in adults, Ranucci and collaborators, he found that uh, there's a threshold in oxygen delivery, which is about 280. Now, this is probably not the only thing which matters because there is a differential to control between the extra renal and the renal blood flow during bypass. And we can clearly see that in animals, if we have a perfect bypass with a perfect oxygen delivery 
systemic oxygen delivery, yet the renal oxygen delivery will drop as soon as we start the bypass. Now, the, the kidney has uh, autoregulation mechanisms, three of them mostly. The most important is a myogenic response, which will uh, uh, result in vasoconstriction as soon as the pressure in the artery will increase. There is also what we call a, a very, very uh, weak mechanism, which delays the artery, renal artery in case of low cardi uh, flow pressure in, in the vessel. And this will result in what we call the pressure autoregulation of the, of the kidney, which you can see here, which is very similar to what we see in the brain. The problem is it is impaired much quicker when the pressure drops than it is in the brain. But not only it's impaired quickly when the pressure drops, but it's also impaired during hypotonic bypass, which is quite common uh, in our practice. So you can see there's a very clear correlation between the pressure and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, the, the flow in, in the kidney. The second mechanism is a tubular glomerular feedback, which when the salt, which, in, uh, which arrives to the macula densa, increases in concentration and requires more salt reabsorption, will produce, will result in a vasoconstriction on the afferent artery. So this will decrease the salt load which arrives from macula densa and will decrease the workload of the macula densa. Unfortunately, this works also when the, the medulla is, is um, injured and where it where it's hypoxia in the tubular medulla, uh, in, the tube, in the tubes. This makes sense because we will decrease the workload on, of the macula densa. But the problem is this will result in vasoconstriction of the, of the whole kidney and also of the, of the vessels which, which, um, which deliver oxygen to the to tubes. So obviously there's also a differential control between the cortex and the medullary blood flow within the kidney. And we can see it, clear, see, see it here Again, this is experimental in animals which are put on anesthesia and then they're put on bypass. We see the pressure goes down when we start anesthesia. The renal blood flow goes down. However, cortical PO2 and the medullary PO2 are still maintained. But as soon as we go on bypass, cortical PO2 is maintained, but medullary PO2 isn't anymore. Now, there's a specific action of bypass on, medula, on the medullary uh, uh, oxygen delivery. This is even worse when we have anemia. These are again our animals. The black points are the anemic animals and the white points are the controls. You can see the blood flow is similar in both. The tissue PO2 and the cor in the cortex is approximately maintained, but in the medulla is really very low. Now, this is a simulation from based on real data from animal, and it uh, shows us the PO2 in the uh, alpha medulla. The baseline is here. When animals are put on bypass, there's very little modification of the medullary PO2. When uh, are, they are put on hypothermia, there starts to be a difference, especially because autoregulation will be will be impaired, but the most dangerous moment is rewarming. And, and that, that's when the medullary PO2 goes really very low. And this has been also observed in, in adults because they ha it has been shown that they have a 34% higher risk of developing kidney injury if, there are, if they stay with an arterial line temperature above 37 degrees for more than 10 minutes. Um, hemodynamic factors are not the only ones, and there has been a lot of work showing that also, sorry, uh, that, uh, that hemolysis could be a key factor which leads to kidney injury. And this is because oxyhemoglobin and free heme, they are passively filtered. They arrive directly to the, to the tubes and they um, induce oxidative injury. And they will also precipitate because the urines are acid and they will obstruct the tubes. 
Additionally, they will uh, consume uh, the nitric oxide, which is available at this level. And here we can see that there is a very clear correlation between the concentration of the free heme in the, in the blood and the nitric oxide consumed in uh, consumption. And this is a, a main problem because uh, nitric oxide bioavailability is central for the kidney protection during bypass. It, it creates renal vasodilatation. It, create, it maintains endothelial integrity and protects against oxidative stress. So maybe nitric oxide bioavailability is a key element. Now, renal monitoring during the bypass is quite difficult and we cannot re reliably uh, use uh, global oxygenation parameters. Um, unfortunately, all the work which has been done during the last decade on bio, early biomarkers is also only uh, allows us to observe installed kidney injury. So we have really to find some, some tools to directly observe oxygenation of the medulla. Now, near infrared spectroscopy could be one of them. And indeed, it has been shown that when near RSO2, the renal RSO2 is, is going, is decreasing, there is a risk of kidney injury postoperatively. Now, I cannot assure you that putting a near probe on the lumbar re region would only, only uh, measure uh, the re renal oxygenation. And probably we should rather speak about of somatic RSO2 instead of renal SO2. However, what is very interesting is that somatic circulation has sympathetically modulated resistances, which is not the case of cerebral circulation. Here you can see the cerebral and the somatic RSO2 in neonates at rest, and there is a clear difference between the two. And there's a gradient which normally should be of 10, 15%, because the, the, the brain will extract more oxygen at rest than the, than the kidney. However, when there is a low output, inadequate perfusion during bypass, there will be an activation of the sympathetic system and the re renal extraction and the somatic extraction will increase. So this gradient will decrease. So this is a very, very, uh, very early sign of, of uh, an, an, an inadequate blood flow. What is the most interesting but with and up to now is still only experimental is to measure the uh, PO2 in the urine. Why? Because you can clearly see how close is the ascending vasa recta, which is just next to the ascending limb of the hand loop, to the collecting duct. That means that the PO2 in the urine, in the bladder, is a clear uh, um, uh, reflection of the PO2 in the medulla. Now, the strategies which we can use actually to, to, to reduce the risk of kidney injury, of course, Global DO2 has to be maintained. This should be um, should be really a, a very important. However, we know which is a critical DO2 in adults. Very recently, we have determined retrospectively. Our group determined in a retrospective analysis and showed that a neonatal critical DO2 could be 340. But however, this has to be still validated at at a, a larger level. Um, the perfusion pressure should be maintained. So if in gray, I show the perfusion pressure, um, which is normal for age, for some a child who is awake. In red, in, in green, sorry, uh, the child which is asleep, a 10% drop. And here's what we measured during bypass in a group of 200 uh, infants. And here, what we did, we did this calculation of excursion beyond, uh, below the threshold. And we showed that if excursions of more than 40% below the normal uh, pressure for age last for more than 20 minutes, there is a risk that more than 70% of the children will develop kidney injury. So I, I would say that 40% drop of, uh, compared to normal um, pressure for age is a reasonable, is a reasonable uh, threshold for, for the pressure. We also have very clear um, strategies how to rewarm patients. We shouldn't increase the, the, line, the temperature on the arterial line more than 37. Also, we should not uh, rewarm faster than 0.5 degrees per, 
per, per minute. We should avoid anemia and we also should avoid transfusion. So in my opinion, this can only go through a miniaturization of the bypass circuit. You can clearly, clearly see that each extra um, blood unit used will double, more than double the risk of kidney injury postoperatively. And you can also see, this is our experience uh, retrospectively, that when we decreased the, the priming volume of our bypass pumps, we also decreased clearly the number of blood units you need to use. But also who, others who, um, who propose to use vasodilators, renal vasodilators, the problem is they're not specifically renal, so there's always a bit of hypertension accompanying hypertension. However, clearly we can see that the tubular injury is reduced when you use this kind of renal vaso vasodilators. And this is um, a postoperatively uh, the, uh, reduction of almost 50% of the kidney injury on using the X. Uh, sodium bicarbonate could be used also. This has been shown in, 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 in adults to, to reduce the risk of severe kidney injury by uh, significantly. And the, probably the most interesting, but still experimental today, is to use nitric oxide during the bypass. So this is a randomized trial using nitric oxide during the bypass through the oxygenator and postoperatively through the, through the ventilator until the patient has been, was extubated. And here you can see that patients who receive nitric oxide, they do, did not have this, this very uh, problematic uh, nitric oxide consumption in the, in the plasma, whereas the other ones did. And what is striking to see is that when during the first week postoperatively, the risk of kidney injury was, was reduced by almost 25%, but mostly the risk of chronic kidney injury one year later was, was reduced almost by 50%. And to my, to my knowledge, this is the only intervention which has reported this kind of results in, in, in during bypass. This is a summary of what I just told you. So kidney injury is a tubular medullary problem. Um, it is, we, we have a problem of renal uh, oxygenation monitoring and we should go towards this new uh, monitoring devices. And the strategies are um, optimizing oxygen delivery, perfusion pressure, avoid renal hypotonia, avoid hemolysis and massive transfusions. And all the rest is still to be to be to be developed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bojan. If you can uh, stop uh, sharing, and then we will have Dr. Vatskitz uh, share his uh, screen. Okay, Dr. Vatskit is the head of pediatric anesthesia at the Department of Anesthesiology, Pharmacology, and Intensive Care at the University Hospital of uh, Geneva. Uh, his principal clinical interest is on the effect of the perioperative period on the post-op behavioral and cognitive outcome in children. Uh, his basic science and research activity is to elucidate the mechanism underlying anesthesia-induced modulation of neuroplasticity in the developing brain. He is currently the president of the European Society for Pediatric Anesthesiology, as well as the editor of anesthesiology um, and section editor of pediatric anesthesia. Thank you, Dr. Vatskitz. You are still muted, if you can unmute. Okay, here we go. Thank Perfect. you very Thank much you. for this kind introduction, and it's truly an honor to be part of this excellent panel. So I was asked to talk about neuromonitoring in the operating room. And um, um, so I have some disclosures. I'm on several journals, and I also had consulting for some uh, companies involved in, in monitoring, but none of them has anything to do with my talk today. So I was asked to talk about the future of uh, neuromonitoring and I'm, I'm not very, um, it's, it's, it's a bit difficult to talk about the future when we don't know the future. So I quite agree with uh, Mr. Churchill who said that uh, it's always better 
to prophesize uh, once an event has already taken place. So what I'd like to, 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 to talk about today is what are the potential ways to, to explore in, uh, in neuromonitoring. And spe specifically, I would like to ignite some thoughts on why is it that it, it's now for decades that we are talking about neuromonitoring. And, uh, and at the end of the day, we don't have a clinically reliable or usable neuromonitoring. So the issue profile is that there is clearly a need for neuromonitoring in, in, in cardiac, congenital cardiac surgery because neuro, neurodevelopment and disability is clearly one of the most common complications. Now, the, the plain, plain truth is that th there is no clinical evidence for any therapeutic effects of perioperative neuromonitoring uh, in congenital cardiac surgery. And, uh, and, and that's something that, that, that should bother us quite a bit. And my, my idea in the next couple of minutes is to talk about this and to ask the questions, why is it so? And once we ask the questions, that's one of the first way to try to find the answers. The thing is that it's worth to talk about it because there is at least a theoretical rationale that multimodal neuromonitoring could be of potential clinical interest. And also, if you look at the literature in the past 20, 25 years, there are some observations suggesting that some changes in some neuromonitoring modalities could be associated with worse outcome. So why are why we don't have a, a, a clinical benefit so far that can be clearly demonstrated in, in congenital heart disease. One is getting back to the congenital heart disease itself and the neuromorbidity, the pathology of neuromorbidity, is, which is very multifactorial. There are many of the, the, the problems, those are inherited, genetic, and, and many of those are required before the perioperative period, during either ischemic or hemorrhagic, or even after. And these events are highly dynamic in nature and uh, the, the physiology and the neurobiology behind or understanding on that remains very, very poor. And when we don't really understand things, it's very difficult to, to monitor them. And to go further, I think that uh, it's not an overstatement to say that we don't really know what we want to monitor when we talk about monitoring neuromorbidity, or if we have some idea on what to monitor, we are not sure where to monitor it. We've just heard the talk on renal uh, nearest monitoring. We don't really know where we monitor it. We neither know when to monitor it and how to monitor it. So a couple of difficult questions. And I think one of the most important thing that we should talk about is that we don't really have a general agreement on clinically relevant outcome measures uh, right now. If you look at the literature, you have as many outcome measures as papers available. So what do we want to really monitor in the uh, OR on the intensive care unit to prevent this? Of course, I think we would all agree that the, the, the best way would be to monitor neurological status, which is probably the best monitoring. It's a bit difficult in our case because that would need an awake patient and we rarely have them. So the other thing we want to monitor, because at the end of the day that counts is that the cells have enough uh, oxygen and, and food. So we want to have adequate brain and blood supply and oxygenation in order to assure appropriate CNS function. And we want also, or we may want to monitor electrical activity of the brain to avoid seizures because we think that seizures can be wrong. Also to avoid birth suppression or to put it in another way to assure an adequate depth of sedation. And altogether, what we want to do is to optimize network homo neuronal network homeostasis. Now, there are many different modalities, which you all know very well, that can monitor this. TCD and NIRS uh, are relatively good tools to, to, to monitor brain supply oxygenation. Electrical activity is often monitored by EEG or different kinds of processed EEGs or, or amplitude amp amplified EEGs. And we can also have radiolic radiological imaging, or even invasive monitoring, uh, such as intracranial pressure or, or brain microdialysis. So as I said, there are many available literature on this, but none of these uh, modalities have been really proved to have a clinical value. So if we, they don't have a, a therapeutic benefit, should we really monitor them? My personal answer is yes, and I'd like to make my case. One is that uh, 
I think that each and every neuromonitoring modality has its inherent and practical advantages and disadvantages. So I think that when we use neuromonitors, we really have to understand at least the basics of physics behind it, what to monitor. For example, if we talk about NIRS, if we understand what it monitors, we won't be um, we won't be scared that nearest values of a tomato or whatever kind of uh, vegetable is quite similar to what we would like to have in the OR. Uh, and also, if we, if we understand how they work, that could allow us to study specific aspects of physiology, pathophysiology, independently of the therapeutic benefit. And as I thought that we, our understanding is very scarce on the, the perioperative neurobiology of, of congenital heart disease, so if we have means to study physiology and pathophysiology, I think it's already a good thing. And also all these monitors are excellent teaching tools at the, in the OR for residents, fellows, or even uh, for other staff members. And of, of course, very often during these discussions that good ideas on what to do can arise. And altogether, that means that it can help to keep the academic spirit. And I think it's very, very important in a, in a, in a, in a university setting, at least. And last but not least, the absence of evidence is, of course, not the evidence of absence. So it's not because so far they didn't show any therapeutic benefit that we shouldn't use them. And. Uh, Using neuromonitoring would allow us, as I thought, to, to allow us to, to have continuous research and development in the domain. And here I would really like to stress the importance that it should be a public-private venture because most of the neuromonitoring modalities are being developed by the industry. And uh, actually we test them. So it should be a, a, an ongoing collaboration between the public and the industry to, to make this research and development. There are some new, uh, insights, for example, in NIRS monitoring, multi-channel functional NIRS monitoring is coming more and more in, in neurology, and uh, it allows continuous assessment of cortical hemodynamics at large. Using such kind of devices, so far it's quite cumbersome, but that could allow us to, to, to extend the, 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 the cortical windows we are monitoring during the anesthesia. There should be, of course, also many development on NIRS monitoring regarding um, uh, the, the uh, how NIRS monitoring can be applied in, in children with high hematocrits, for example. Something that is very interesting and coming more and more in neurobiology and neuropsychology is the combined use of NIRS and EEG monitoring, because it really provides insights into linking hemodynamics and function. And if we link hemodynamics and function, that would allow us to thoroughly study, for example, cerebral autoregulation, because we always talk about cerebral autoregulation, but we didn't really, we, we, we haven't yet demonstrated that it really does exist, uh, strictly speaking. And of course, these are quite sophisticated methodologies, and um, we surely need to have sophisticated AI algorithms to provide meaningful bedside clinical uh, benefits of this and, and decision tools. But clearly something to look forward in, in terms of, of, of research and development. And I think that as a clinician, the, the, the most important question is if there is a place for conducting trials on the potential benefits of multimodal perioperative neuromonitoring. Because as I said, that there are no trials available uh, in, 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 in our specific perioperative setting in, in congenital uh, car, uh, heart disease and operations. There are, of course, several protocols showing perioperative neuromonitoring. Those are available and published. Now, it's important to realize that all these protocols are purely expert opinion based, and none of them is validated in, 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 in real life. So we are using them because we think that that should be okay, but we don't really know if they help or not. There is only one retrospective study, which dates back now more than 20 years, that suggests some benefits of multimodal neuromonitoring. And I'd like to show this very briefly, even if it, it's not the future, but it, it dates back to 23 years. So it's a retrospective review, not prospective, 250 pediatric cardiac surgery patient. They had multimodal neuromonitoring using NIRS, transcranial Doppler EEG, and they had three groups. One, when there were no warning signs for neuromorbidity stemming from these three modalities, and then they did no intervention, or they had a warning sign, they did no intervention, or they had a warning sign for neuromorbidity, and they did an intervention in order to try to, 
increase or restore the values of these uh, modalities. And uh, to make a long story short, but they found that in the group where there was an intervention, when there was an event, the, uh, the uh, hospital stay was shorter than where they didn't do any intervention. And there were more uh, patients discharged uh, after seven days than in the no intervention group. And if you look at the timeline over the months here, you can see, and it's quite interesting in terms of quality improvement, that more that when people started to, to, to have these multimodal uh, monitoring modalities, they really started to act so the group where there was no intervention when there was a uh, when there was a warning site basically went down to zero and uh, the clinicians started to intervene actively when they they saw changes in neuromonitoring again if you look at the outcome measures it's length of stay uh, median length of stay and person discharge at se uh, uh, seven days so there are clearly challenging in, in, in setting up studies and trials for evaluating the benefits of neuromonitoring in uh, congenital cardiac surgery. Uh, I, I think it should be a multi-centric international effort because if you look at the past 20 or 30 years, there are many observational studies. Most of them are uh, unicentric and with a, a small number of patients. And one of the most important the task would be at first to identify or agree upon the outcome measures. Those are really public health relevance uh, in, in terms of what do we measure. We shouldn't measure just surrogate endpoints because what's the, the real life relevance of this. And in order to do this, we should in, involve stakeholders of different horizons, not just cardiac anesthesiologists and surgeons, but also policymakers, patients, and maybe, maybe other groups as well. I think uh, most of you know about the Pediatric Perioperative Outcome Group Initiative, where we are already trying to identify at least some potentially relevant outcome measures, but this is something that should clearly be done in, in, in our particular field in, in congenital uh, perioperative care. And we should design a practical trial, meaning that if we do something that should be applicable in, 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 in most places in everyday clinical practice, and also, in addition to trials, I think there is a place using different neuromonitoring modalities for well-designed prospective observational studies because they could provide guidance on, on what to focus on and how to, to drive these clinical trials. So very briefly, the take-home message is that you like it or not, there is no clinical evidence for therapeutic effects of perioperative neuromonitoring in congenital cardiac surgery. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't apply this neuromonitoring because it will keep the academic spirit and thereby foster research and development in the field. And I think that setting up an international consortium to design appropriate research step is really an important in this domain. So I uh, stop here and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Brodskitz. And I'm gonna ask you to stop sharing and Dr. Hubbard to start sharing your screen. Dr. Haber is a senior consultant in pediatric anesthesia. He is the head of the unit for anesthesiology investigation at Geneva University Hospital. He's a professor of anesthesiology at the Faculty of Medicine in Geneva. His research activity is uh, focused on the anesthesia management of children with uh, bronchial hyperresponsiveness. He has a particular research interest in lung function, mechanical ventilation, and heart-lung interaction. Uh, additional research focuses on quality improvement projects in pediatric anesthesia. Finally, he's the deputy editor of European Journal of Anesthesiology. Thank you, Walid. Thank you, Vivian, for this nice introduction, and uh, thank you for the Academy for putting this uh, nice panel all together. So um, that's a big challenge to uh, give a talk in 10 minutes about optimization of ventilation in the cardiac operating room. I have no uh, disclosure. Uh, so I um, actually concentrated my talk on three major topics. What would be the optimal PEEP? What would be the best ventilation strategy both during cardiac surgery and during uh, bypass? And finally, what would be the optimal oxygenation during uh, a bypass and cardiac surgery? So uh, let's start with the first thing. As you know, 
uh, cardiopulmonary bypass is associated to an increase in ventilation perfusion mismatch for different reasons, and particularly the lung inflammation and lung ischemia. But that will lead to inhomogeneity, ventilation inhomogeneity, and also unstable alveoli. What does it mean? It does mean that you have some alveoli that will be closed, and these uh, closed alveoli, each time you ventilate positively, you will have repetitive recruitment and collapse. And that will exert an excessive dynamic shear stress on the alveolar walls, will, which will uh, um, lead to also alveolar instability. Also around I think we lost Walid here with the internet connection. Um, maybe while he's waiting to reconnect, we can do a poll uh, so that we can uh, be um, interacting with our uh, participants. Uh, Grace, do you have the first poll? Maybe we can pull it up. And this is looking at the specialty. What is the audience's specialty that is uh, participating today? That way we can have an idea of who we are uh, today in the audience. If you can go ahead and answer, you can just click on the one of the answers and then we can show the votes. Results is coming, Vivian. We are looking to re the results. Okay, good. I wasn't sure. <laughs> yeah, you Thank said you. more or less 60% uh, anesthesiologist. I, I will finish now. Okay. Let's. So we have 57% of anesthesiologists, we have 7% surgeon, 13% cardiologist, 13% intensivist. So we are mixed. Yes, we are the, pre the biggest uh, group, Sasha, unfortunately for you, <laughs> but we are. <laughs> Being we came for 4% to 60%. So it, it's amazing. <laughs> can I and, and the second one? We can do the second one, yes. And this is the location. Where are the, our um, audience from? So please take a few minutes to answer this. Someone is saying that we need more intensives <laughs> in the chat. Next time. Next time. We have a few that are anesthesiologists <laughs> and intensivists in this, in the panel at least. <laughs> it's never yeah, yeah. This it's is never. the results. <laughs> okay, here's the answers. So the biggest group is from Latin America. Uh, we have 33%, Europe 20%, uh, the US, if we group them all together, they're around 11%, Canada uh, 2%, and uh, yeah, so it's a big distribution, I guess, all over the world, which is great, and thank you all for joining. Um, I am not sure we see Walid, uh, the panelist. Uh, Dr. Vatskitz, if he's your neighbor in the office, do you want to check on him? <laughs> Maybe he can join you in your office. I will just time. go there and see what's going that on. That would be great. Yes. Thank you. Um, we have another poll about NIRS. You want to, uh, you want to yes. learn? Yes. Let's, let's go ahead with that. Thank you. So in your practice, do you routinely use NIRS monitoring during congenital heart surgery? And this is just a yes or no question here. Mm. Uh, this is uh, 
Wow. Very, this is interesting. Okay. So 56% yes, 44% no. I was thinking more that we're going to have more yes than no. That would be interesting to discuss maybe in the Q&A at the end. Dr. Vatskis, the results of the NIRS might be interesting for you is yes, 56%, but we have 44% of the people that don't use it routinely during congenital heart surgery. It would be interesting, I think, Vivian, to be able to separate that out by geographic distribution, which we can do later. Okay, perfect. That would be great. Thanks. And then uh, we have one more, Paul. Yes. Here we are. Do you have a specific protocol to handle changes in neuromonitoring values during the perioperative period? I think that on this answer, you have to work a lot because it's very interesting. Yes. You will see. Here we go. Okay. That's your next research there, Dr. Ratzke. <laughs> <laughs> yes. okay. We Not have true. one more question about fibrogen supplementation. Yes. We have another poll. Yes, one more. Here we go. So which one of those options should not be considered fibrinogen supplementation in neonates and children bleeding after cardiopulmonary bypass? This is for those of you who have listened to Dr. Ferroni David's talk. Sorry, I'm back. I'm sorry, we've lost yeah. the connection. I don't know why. That's okay. <laughs> okay, we finished the poll. We have uh, more than 60%. Perfect. Okay. Thank you for that answer. And we can have a discussion later. I'm going to let Dr. Hubbard share his screen again and we can continue with the presentations. Where did we stop? Sorry about that. So you got disconnected. You okay? Okay. Yes. yes. So yeah, I, I was saying that we should not neglect the complex interaction between the pulmonary vasculature and the alveolar function. And this mechanical interdependence between the two compartments explain in part the direct ventricular uh, uh, interaction. When you apply positive pressure ventilation with PEEP or large tidal volume, you do increase pulmonary vascular resistance, and that will lead to interaction, direct ventricular interaction with increase in right ventricular and diastolic uh, volume, and that will lead to a shift of the septum towards the left, and then an effect on the left ventricle with the decrease in stroke volume. So another important point is what happens in the lung blood volume when you uh, put, uh, uh, you uh, apply a PEEP. Uh, here I uh, show you a very nice study we did with the high resolution synchrotron by giving xenon uh, for the ventilation and iodine for the perfusion. We looked at the ventilation perfusion at two levels of PEEP and two levels of tidal volume. And as you can see on this graph, in the dependent lungs and here non-dependent lungs, well, there is like a cyclic blood volume redistribution during ventilation and the PEEP effect is quite impressive. So the PEEP does increase or enhance the volume redistribution during each breath. So what's new in this area? The, how to optimize the PEEP? Well, this is a very recent study where these authors use the lung ultrasound to assess and monitor PEEP to actually monitor what is the best PEEP to have a lung re in congenital heart uh, kids. So what's interesting here is to, uh, uh, actually it's very easy to learn. You have to learn how to detect the sea lines or some um, hyperechoic tissue pattern, and that will help you what would be the best optimal PEEP. Again, when you increase PEEP, in, um, uh, with the goal of having increase in aerated lung tissue or have lung recruitment, you actually increase specific tidal volume. 
In this case, you really need to decrease the driving pressure. Well, the driving pressure is this, this specific tidal volume, which is the tidal volume you are applying over the end expiratory lung volume, which is actually what is, uh, what is your PEEP is doing plus the compliance of the lung is determining the end expiratory lung volume. So to finish this first part, the heart-lung interaction must not be neglected during control ventilation. It's important to remember that the vasculopulmonary interactions in the lung may be as important as cardiopulmonary interactions in determining the effects of PEEP on cardiac output. And then remember that in healthy lungs, PEEP is protective only if associated with the reduced tidal volume, otherwise you might be harmful. Now, the second point I want to share with you is what would be the best ventilation strategy in CHD and during CPB? Well, what you need is actually a uh, ventilation mode that can adapt quickly to the continuous changes in lung compliance during cardiac surgery. And today, we have a mode which is in most of the anesthesia machines, which is the pressure regulated volume control mode, because this mode is actually uses decelerated flow and it does uh, allow to have a very low driving pressure to guarantee the tidal volume and have similar tidal volume despite the changes in lung compliance. So how to do this? Well, I would recommend you to always set your pressure control mode to eight mils per kilo taking into account the child, the cardiac disease to see what is the minimal PEEP you have to apply. And then you have to reduce the tidal volume per one mil per kilo until you reach six mil per kilo, having the goal always to have the lowest driving pressure less than 13 centimeters of water. And when you have the tidal volume that is achieved, you switch to pressure regulated volume control. And then what, what do you do when during bypass? So there are three ways and people are doing everything in uh, all over the world. So either you have static with no CPAP or ZIP, as we say, zero PEEP, or it's static with PEEP or CPAP, or you ventilate with very low tidal volume. So what's the evidence? Actually, there have been two systematic reviews, one in 2012 and one recent in 2018, and both systematic reviews have demonstrated that if you compare static ZIP or no ZIP with CPAP or PEEP, you may improve the alveolar arterial oxygen gradient. However, there's no effect on the patient outcome. If you compare with low tidal volume, whether you apply a CPAP or no CPAP, there is no improvement in any. In fact, you have a, there was a large heterogeneity and very small sap <clears throat> sample sizes. So actually today there is no evidence for an effect on patient outcome. Surprisingly, currently, there are about five clinical trials all over the world looking in adults, but not in children, what would be the best uh, mode, ventilation mode during cardiac bypass to improve a patient outcome, and particularly lung, uh, decreased lung inflammation. So what are the key points of this part? So remember, bypass-related lung injury is mainly due to pulmonary ischemia, leukocyte trapping, and to the inflammatory response. A ventilatory strategy that includes protective tidal volumes, optimized PEEP levels, CPAP during CPB may reduce lung inflammatory response, and thereby we hope to decrease postoperative complications. No trial with enough power provides evidence-based optimal strategy for lung protection during CPB. There is some evidence for an advantage of CPAP during CPB, though. Third part of my talk will be on the optimal oxygenation during CPB. So when we talk about hyperoxia during CPB, when we talk about partial pressure in oxygen over 200 millimeters of mercury. On the physiological basis, if you look at the formula, you can understand that dissolved oxygen contributes minimally to oxygen delivery, whether with the cardiac output or the pump flow, whatever. So increasing the dissolved oxygen, if you have saturation of 100%, hemoglobin stable will have minimal benefit on oxygen delivery. If you go from 150 millimeters of mercury to 350, 300 millimeters of mercury, you just increase by 3% your oxygen delivery. The other thing that you need to know, there is a, a large interaction between cardiopulmonary bypass and hyperoxia with both the oxidative stress 
and the inflammation. The cardiopulmonary bypass induces biomaterial and non uh, 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 biomaterial dependent and um, biomaterial independent systemic inflammation. These factors inf uh, initiate a complex cascade of humoral and cell mediated inflammatory response. On the other hand, you have to uh, uh, also understand that the enhanced reactive oxygen species product, uh, production following bypass triggers similarly to the other pathway, uh, they, it triggers uh, uh, common signal transduction pathways, amplifying inflammation and systemat uh, systemic inflammatory response syndrome. By the end of the day, the inflammation uh, thus induces oxidative stress and vice versa, generating what we call a vicious uh, circle, and that will lead to organ injury and dysfunction. So what is known about the cardiovascular harmful effects of oxygen? We know that high concentration of oxygen will lead to reactive oxygen species, but will also increase angiotensin 1, decrease adenosine, and these will contribute to the coronary uh, vasoconstriction and systemic vasoconstriction and hemodynamic impairment. And also reactive oxygen species can trigger arrhythmia. And this is important to consider. So what's the evidence in the literature? Actually, I'm gonna present you a recent um, uh, systematic uh, review and meta-analysis uh, looking at 33 studies with 40 two data sets, and it includes a um, different group of patients, healthy volunteers, coronary artery disease, heart failure, cabbage, or sepsis. And it clearly demonstrates that hyperoxia over 200 millimeters of mercury, it, uh, pro, uh, it induces a, a significantly decrease in stroke volume and increase in systemic, uh, systemic vascular resistance and thus decrease in cardiac output, particularly in patients with, decree, with having heart failure. So um, what is in the pediatric population now? Well, we only have a, a very nice uh, prospective study from a consortium coming from eight institution in the looking at mortality uh, in the uh, 40 hour, 80 hours after uh, uh, starting ECMO in children less than 18 years old. Uh, of age. Uh, you have, uh, just to show you here, that more than 50% of the cohort were congenital heart disease kids. And you can see on this graph that these kids having uh, increased uh, PaO2 over 200 have significantly higher mortality in the first 48 hours. So what are the key points uh, of uh, this part? Well, today there is currently no evidence supporting the notion that oxygen supplementation increases oxygen delivery during bypass. There's not enough evidence yet to specify the optimal oxygen target. Nevertheless, there is some evidence demonstrating that PaO2 over 200 millimeters of mercury during bypass or ECMO could be harmful due to the oxidative stress, vasoconstriction, perfusion heterogeneity of the microcirculation and diastolic dysfunction. In conclusion, I would like to show you this graph to just remind you that you cannot just apply one ventilation strategy to each patient and uh, cardiac patient. You have to individualize depending on the patient and the depending on the cardiac disease itself. And this has to be taken into account with the hemodynamic parameters and also other parameters like the hemoglobin, the CO2, and potentially with monitoring the NIRS, the uh, venous saturation in oxygen, and you have to individualize ventilation strategy to improve oxygen delivery and optimize oxygen transport. And thank you for your attention, and I'm really sorry for this disconnection. Thank you, Dr. Robert. Thank you, Walid. Thank you for all the speakers for the first session. It's been a great session. And as you can see, the Q&A and the chat has multiple questions. If you want to take time during the second session to try and answer these questions, it would be great. I'm going to introduce Dr. Vernovsky, who is also the co-founder of the Congenital Heart Academy with Dr. Agadi. And I think, Gil, you had something to want to say? <laughs>
You are still muted, Gil. Okay, can you see that screen right there? Yes, we can see it and we can hear you. Yeah, I'm just, I'm very excited uh, to talk about just a couple of things very quickly. The Congenital Cardiac Anesthesia Society, uh, as well as the Pediatric Intensive Care Society, the Congenital Heart Academy, of course, uh, have been doing these webinars in a way of helping us to plan for the World Congress of Pediatric Cardiology, which COVID permitting will still be taking place in Washington uh, in September uh, of 2021, but it's been quite clear that we will need to have and will have a live digital option. I wanted to just say for just a second about an article that was published um, just nine days ago by many of the people that are on this panel, which are the recommendations for pediatric heart programs during COVID-19. And in fact, one of our, um, one of the questions that came up earlier is, what does all this mean from a congenital cardiac anesthesia perspective? I looked at this this morning, um, and this is the on the left, the red is the active cases uh, currently uh, in the global uh, distribution, as well as the case fatality rate. And as people know, the, um, the pandemic has spread and seems to now be going into the direction of where the majority of our attendees are on the call today, which is Mexico, South America, and over into Asia. Um, this is uh, the COVID um, active case rate as of today. Uh, and next Tuesday, the authors of that manuscript will be presenting, uh, along with uh, Congenital Heart Academy and the Pediatric Cardiac Intensive Care Society, a one-hour webinar on what the COVID uh, outbreak has meant for congenital cardiac programs. And as many of you know, uh, many of the programs in the United States and also Europe have started to reopen. And the lessons learned from that will be discussed by these authors. Uh, and uh, if you'd like some information about this, it's been in the chat. It will be co-sponsored, as you can see here, by the Anesthesia Society, the Cardiac ICU Society, uh, also the um, Congenital Heart Academy, and through our Telemedicine Center at Children's National here in Washington. Uh, this will be in the chat. I hope some of you can join us, uh, and we look forward to presenting this very timely topic with a nine-day hold publication by the people who actually wrote it. Uh, that's, um, that's all I wanted to share with everybody. We can move over to Dr. Zanai now, uh, if that's okay to introduce the next part of the program. Yes, thank you, Gail. I had one slide I wanted to share with uh, everyone about the society. Um, so this is the Congenital Cardiac Anesthesia Society. Um, we've been mentioning a few times, uh, we would encourage people who are not members to join us and become member. You will have access to educational content, uh, participation on committees, special interest group, discounted registration fees for the society as well as the Society of Pediatric Anesthesia. And um, uh, obviously it will be part of our community. So we would encourage you to join us if you are not a member yet. And uh, to continue moving on with the program, I would like to introduce Dr. Zanai. Dr. Zanai uh, Rosanna is a pediatric cardiac anesthesiologist and intensivist at the uh, Mediterranean Pediatric Heart Center in Taormina uh, in Italy. Dr. Zanai. We cannot hear you, Rosanna. We can see you, but not hear you. We cannot hear you. We cannot hear you, Rosanna. We can see you. Can you maybe present the next speaker while Rosa try to, to solve this uh, technical issue and then she comes back for the next one. Is that okay? 
Yeah, for sure. Our next uh, speaker is Dr. Uh, Philip Arnold. He's been a consultant in pediatric cardiac anesthesia at Alder Hay Children's Hospital since 2002 in Liverpool. Uh, prior to this, he underwent fellowship training in Liverpool, Toronto, and Newcastle. He has a wide range of clinical interests around the perioperative care of children. And uh, these include enhanced recovery of cardiac patients, perioperative echo, and management of severe bleeding. Uh, he has a wide range of research interests in pediatric anesthesia, is a member of the editorial board of pediatric anesthesia, and uh, chairs the APKI scientific committee. Uh, Dr. Arnold, if you want to uh, share your screen now. Thank you. Okay, hi. Um, can everyone hear me? Uh, I'm Philip Arnold. I'm talking today about enhanced recovery. Uh, I'm going to take a couple of liberties with the title, first of all. Um, it is about the patient who's doing well, but what I don't want to do is suggest that this is only about our simplest um, and most straightforward patients. This has to be about more complex patients as well if it's to make a difference. Secondly, Enhanced recovery after surgery has been a popular thing, particularly in adult um, perioperative care. Uh, and we can't simply apply concepts that have been developed for adults undergoing colorectal surgery and apply them to um, apply them to children undergoing heart surgery. I have no disclosures. Um, enhanced recovery. Um, these are two definitions of enhanced recovery, and they both work pretty well. Basically, this is about modifying, um, making specific interventions during the care of your patients during the perioperative um, period, but also modifying the way in which care is structured and organized in a way that tries to encourage a situation where patients get more rapidly back to independent functioning um, and, um, and hopefully go home. The bit that perhaps I take a slight issue with is the evidence-based bit. With regard to pediatric heart surgery, there is very, very little evidence base for anything I'm going to say over the next few minutes. Um, I'm not going to present any papers. I'm going to talk about things that we're doing that seem to work. I'm also going to talk about things that I'd, I'd like us to be doing more. Um, why do this? Well, first of all, we should do this because it just seems inherently to be a good thing to me. But um, it's something that I think we all want. We all want our patients to get better and get back to normal life sooner. And hopefully, if we do it right, we can improve the experience for the families and for our patients. Some of the interventions may improve our outcomes, though we wouldn't want to make exaggerated claims. But primarily, the driver for this is that it's a way of improving the use of resources, which may be limited. When we talk about use of resources, this is essentially an economic question. Um, and the way in which this will play out in different countries with healthcare systems that are differently organized and with different um, general economies is going to be different. In the UK and in, in some other countries, this plays out mainly in terms of this. It's that we have high rates of cancelling patients on the day of surgery for no reason other than a lack of intensive care beds. If we think internationally, this probably is a little bit different. Um, internationally, I think there is still huge unmet need in terms of children needing heart surgery. And one way we can try, try and do more heart surgery is by doing heart surgery cheaper. And one way we may be able to do heart surgery cheaper is by some of the ideas we're gonna talk about today. And we make it cheaper basically by keeping the hospitals and intensive cares for a long, shorter period of time and creating them, but it's not just about, it's, it's, or it's not at all about throwing patients out on the street. It's about getting patients to a state where they're naturally ready for discharge sooner. And most enhanced recovery programs are gonna include a series of interventions which we can apply at various times during the perioperative period, both beforehand and, and afterwards and during. We'll, we'll expand a little bit on these. But also we're usually talking about some degree of standardization of care. And usually this goes along with some concept of quality assurance or, or data collection and monitoring. The 
there isn't a lot that's been published. Um, Boston last year published this paper and they describe um, what looks to be a, a very good um, effort at making the hands recovery program in children. Um, it includes most of the elements that I'm going to talk about today. Um, but they reported very early on, they reported really their initial experience with a relatively small group of patients and they didn't really show a great advance to this. It didn't reduce hospital stay, it produced any small improvements in, in intensive care stay. In terms of um, more specific interventions, we'll go, these are listed in the next slides. I won't stress them too much. On this slide, the thing I will bring out is the bottom, making information available to parents. Parents and families need to be need to be partners in this. We need to get them on board with this idea very much. We need to treat and recognize comorbidities. And this concept of prehabilitation, this is about getting rehabilitation professionals, whatever we, we, we call them, we would call them physiotherapists, into the preoperative clinic to talk about mobilization after surgery, to give specific respiratory exercises that the patients can practice at home, and then they're used to them um, in the post-operative period. And for babies, teaching parents how to hold the babies after surgery. Um, Intraoperatively, I very the next talk I think is going to be about early extubation, so I won't talk about it much. But I think this is very much a part of this concept. But achieving the situation where early extubation goes well is about doing other things, and one of the big things I think is improved pain control. We are big exponents of regional anaesthesia. Traditionally, the debate about regional anaesthesia has been about the use of the safety of epidural anaesthesia. Um, I think we can move on from that. I think these days with bedside ultrasound, we can block nerves in a, in a wide variety of places. The approach that we prefer is bilateral single shot ultrasound guided paravertebral blocks, which we do at the beginning of surgery. It's usually not perfect on its own. We still expect to give small doses of opiates, but we think the doses, at least intraoperatively, are reduced substantially. Because the blocks wear off, this won't have that much of an effect the next day. We can use co-analgesic doses, uh, that, drugs, and we can use what we might term simple analgesics. And we should optimize the use of all these modalities. Goes without saying, we want the surgeons to do a good job, and um, we want somebody to check in theater before the patient leaves. The surgeons have definitely done um, the best repair that, that can be achieved in that situation. And there's other things we can do to modify our perioperative management. And we need to extend that good analgesia into the post-operative period. And we need, when we, but pain is only one reason why a baby might be unhappy in the post-operative period. Babies like being wrapped up, they like being fed. So I think early up to, um, feeding the baby sooner is going to be a good thing. And I think putting a bottle in a baby's mouth is going to be a much better intervention on the whole than putting a sedative in them. Um, avoid doing stuff that's just not necessary unless it is necessary. Um, these are size appropriately, but also importantly, recognize when the patient isn't following the plan. Um, and again, the rehabilitation professionals and planning earlier about discharge and thinking about what sort of place the, pet, the patient's going home to, because our, our families vary in terms of their social and economic circumstances. There are barriers to doing this. Um, I love all the people that I work with, but some of them have some fairly set ideas about things which we might be challenging. And this is a particular problem for us because we have a lot of clinicians involved in the care of our patients compared to an orthopedic or a general surgical patient through a lot of different doctors and nurses and other professionals involved. When I say low hanging fruits, what I mean is things that people could reasonably go away from this talk and they could start doing their own hospitals relatively, relatively quickly. Um, I think preoperative iron therapy is just a, 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 a it's, it's just something we should all be doing. Um, getting physiotherapists to come and see patients preoperatively, I think is a good intervention and probably surprisingly, um, and, and parents like it as well. Um, and the physiotherapists like it. Um, the next two sound like complicated interventions, um, but 
in some ways they're not and they're not because they're things that I can effectively drive and I can effectively do do myself they're not things that require sitting in a room with 50 or 100 of my colleagues to try and convince them because the sort of things that are going to make the bigger difference at the end of the day are going to be the organizational changes and the cultural changes within our units and um, which require buy-in from from a whole extended team I'm a bit worried I'm coming here and I'm coming across as some sort of quasi-religious advocate for, for this approach. I, I'm not. We need to be sceptical. As we said, the Boston paper did not show an immediate advantage to introducing these sort of processes. Um, in addition, this is about introducing a whole load of things, more or less all in one go, and we need to decide which of those are the effective things and which of them are maybe less effective. Um, possibly, this is effectively a, a trend new fad, but all I've done is took a series of fairly common sense, simple interventions. We've added a little bit of spice by adding some slightly more controversial things, and then we've wrapped it all up and branded it as um, enhanced recovery. Um, this is possibly true, but I suspect if you go out onto your wards and you look at your post-operative patients, these relatively simple things aren't necessarily happening in a timely way. So in Conclusion. Um, inclusion, I, I, I think enhanced recovery is certainly something we should be trying, that we should be making an effort to introduce and we should be sitting down. And I think it's something with collateral advantages as well as the things that we've talked about. Right. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Dr. Arnold. That, uh, that was really fantastic. Uh, and I completely, uh, we always like talks that agree with our preconceived notions. So I really thought that that was uh, Fantastic. And getting buy-in clearly is always a hard thing uh, from uh, patients that have multiple stakeholders, but it sounds like you're really doing a, a great job with that. Um, I want to see if this works. Hold on. Uh, this one. Okay. Uh, I'm very, very pleased to introduce the next speaker, who's Dr. Susan Nicholson. Um, um, I really have, I'm really great to have the opportunity to do this. I started working with Dr. Nicholson in 1995. I consider her a friend, and she has taught me so much of how to look after babies after surgery and the cardiac intensive care unit. One of the best teachers I've ever had and a very good friend, and obviously just a fantastic uh, congenital cardiac anesthesiologist. Here we are at one of our meetings in CHOP, and we had a, not every day was like this, but most days, uh, we really enjoyed what we were doing, and that makes the care of these kids um, uh, a lot more fun. Uh, Dr. Nicholson has been at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia for qu uh, quite some time, I think since around 1980, if I remember correctly, uh, through the early Bill Norwood days, through the time we all worked together with Tom Spray, uh, and now with a brand new uh, group uh, led by Jonathan Chen and in the intensive care unit. Throughout that, uh, Susan and her team have been a rock of cardiac anesthesia for patients getting surgery for congenital cardiac abnormalities. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that she's uh, uh, she's probably anesthetized close to 2,000 children with hypoplastic left heart syndrome herself. Uh, she uh, is the director of operations at CHOP, and it's really a pleasure, uh, pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Susan Nicholson. I think it's, uh, if you could share your screen, Susan, I think I've already uh, taken mine off. Yeah, I'm hitting the share screen button. There, we can see you now, good. Can you see the slides? No, right? Because I can't see them. No. Not yet. David, any help? Here we go. Yep. We can see it now. Yes. Gil, thank you very much for the nice introduction. I want to thank you and Vivian, as well as the Academy, for inviting me to uh, talk today. Yes, this one. 
Um, I have no disclosures. Over the next 10 minutes, it's my intent uh, to convince you all that uh, early extubation is an evolutionary step in the care of infants undergoing cardiac surgery. I'm gonna start by uh, describing for you what I'm sure you're all aware of is that there's huge variability in the duration of mechanical ventilation after infant heart surgery. I'm gonna define for you what people mean by early extubation, present the arguments for and against early extubation, and then spend a little bit of time talking about a study that uh, was recently done looking at uh, early extubation after two commonly performed infant cardiac procedures and then draw some conclusions. There's huge variability in the time that infants are extubated after uh, cardiac surgery. And I think this is because infants are a very heterogeneous population in regard to their age, their physiology, and the procedures that we perform on them. Also, there's great variability in the anesthesiologist and the ICU uh, care management team, and their timing of extubation is in part dependent on the provider experience and very often on the provider preference. As we heard today, different systems have different issues and different availability of resources to manage a fresh post-op with a natural airway. And looking at the literature, there's very little data on the timing of extubation of infants. And the data that exists is retrospective, it's observational, it's underpowered, and it's very difficult to derive evidence-based guidelines from the data that's there. So what do people mean by early extubation? Well, to some of us, it means in the operating room at the end of the procedure, or on arrival to the ICU prior to hooking up the patient to mechanical ventilation. I like to call this immediate extubation, but I think the vast majority of practitioners would agree on a definition that ex early extubation is within six hours of completion of the cardiac surgery. A very small percentage of our colleagues even define early extubation as by, by the first post-operative morning. So what are the arguments for um, early extubation? Well, I think if you think about it, uh, the vast majority of infants come to our operating room now with a natural airway. If an infant comes to the non-cardiac surgical operating room, it's unquestionable that those patients will be extubated at the end of their procedure. And very often what we're doing to them is far less physiologically perturbing than what's done in the general operating room. If we take the breathing tube out, it obviously minimizes the complications of an indwelling endotracheal tube. For some patients, particularly those with single ventricle, it improves their physiology. And as we just heard in the last talk, it enables us to use non-pharmacologic comfort measures such as swaddling, parental holding, and enteral feeds earlier, which in turn minimizes the patient's exposure to analgesics and sedatives in the ICU. It has the potential to reduce length of stay and to reduce cost. So why aren't more people extubating infants earlier? Well, I think the argument that most practitioners uh, raise is the concern for unexpected need for reintubation and the adverse physiologic consequences of the same. Uh, an extubated airway increases the child's metabolic demand. It eliminates the inability to control the arterial PCO2. And as we heard previously, different analgesia and sedation options have to be chosen both intraoperatively and postoperatively in order to achieve and maintain early extubation. It also may require different care models and change in your current care model to maintain OR efficiency and a CICU modeling model that may require different frontline providers in order to manage a fresh post-op with a natural airway. I'd like to uh, kind of change course here and talk a little bit about uh, collaborative learning. Collaborative learning is a technique that was popularized in the manufacturing industry in which simply teams learn together in an attempt to convert low performing processes to higher or benchmark processes. 
Bill Malley, one of the cardiologists at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, posed the question as to whether collaborative learning could be applied to congenital cardiac care. And in order to answer that question, Bill Malley formed a multidisciplinary team of clinicians to which he added systems engineers from Georgia Tech. And they did a deep dive into perioperative care at five major centers in the United States in an attempt to identify best practices and to see if they could identify a best practice that could be achieved in multi-center adoption. The best practice that was identified by not only the uh, clinician, but also the uh, systems engineer was the duration of mechanical ventilation after two commonly performed cardiac procedures, complete repair of tetralogy of Fallot and co repair by a left thoracotomy. This is data for a year's worth of data at each of the five sites that Malley and his team did site visits in. A couple of things stand out. You can see at site one, not a single infant who underwent tetralogy repair or co surgery was connected to mechanical ventilation on completion of their surgical procedure. This institution happened to be CHOP. If you look at the other sites, you will see that the duration of mechanical ventilation is not only quite different between sites, but for example, look at site five, where you can see the range from of mechanical ventilation range from just a little over a half a day to over a week. So basically Bill Malley was able to convince the Pediatric Heart Network to fund a study to apply collaborative learning to the timing of extubation for these two index infant cardiac procedures. Each of the five sites was asked to put together a multidisciplinary team where they underwent rotational site visits. And while they were at the uh, other sites, they examined best practices as they related to making the patient eligible for early extubation. And each site was charged with identifying the required changes at their own site in order to affect early extubation. Together, the five disciplinary teams created a clinical practice guideline with the aim of extubation within six hours. And they were charged with implementing that within for a 12 month period. Five uh, sites were identified, five control sites were identified that had no exposure to any of the elements of collaborative learning. The primary outcome of the study was the percentage of patients that were extubated after co and tetralogy repair uh, within six hours of completion of their surgery. Look, if you will, at the pre-CPG at both the active and control sites, and you will see that only about 10 to 13% of either a uh, group of patients was extubated as, as uh, pre-CPG. When the CPG was applied to the four active sites other than the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, you can see that the percentage of patients who were extubated within the first six hours increased to 56 and 73% respectively for co and tetralogy. I think any time that you do a major clinical change, it's important to look at a balancing metric, which in this case would be the percentage of patients who needed to be reintubated within uh, 24 hours of their primary extubation within six hours. And you'll see at the four active sites that there was no difference in the percentage of patients who were reintubated when the clinical practice guideline was in effect compared to that prior to the CPG. So let's look a little bit at the work of uh, Vinu Amali from Salt Lake City, who looked at the changes in anesthesia and postoperative sedation that was necessary to affect early extubation. And not surprisingly, he showed that there was a decrease in the intraoperative use of opioid and benzodiazepine in dose. But very interestingly, there was no change in exposure to volatile anesthetic when both opioid and benzos were decreased. The uh, infants both intraoperatively and postoperatively received uh, DEX more frequently and in higher doses, 
and there was a decrease in the use and dose of postoperative benzodiazepine during the CPG. Uh, Michael Gaze, using the uh, PC4 database, looked at uh, the sustainability of early extubation in the 12-month period following the study after the CPG had been used for a year. And one of the four sites, as well as CHOP, continued to maintain early extubation at the CPG study rate. However, three of the four sites, the early extubation rate decreased for the 12 months after the CPG from 70 to 30%, perhaps explained by the Hawthorne effect. Madeline Witte and her colleagues looked at the spillover effect of the collaborative learning project on the rate of early extubation for other infant cardiac procedures and found that for the lower complexity uh, procedures, early extubation increased and it varied obviously by the type of surgical procedure with early extubation increasing the greatest in patients after VSD closure from just a little over a quarter of the patients to nearly a half. She identified that there was, however, no change in the rate of early extubation for high complexity surgeries. So I'd like to conclude by saying that CHOP has pioneered and continues to practice safe, sustained early extubation after even infant heart surgery. Early extubation is reproducible and safe at other centers. The collaborative learning process increased the rate of early extubation after infant heart surgery in the centers participating in the study. And, but however, there are other competing factors that may preclude early extubation. I think most of you are aware that uh, the duration of mechanical ventilation is being looked at as a quality metric. And I think if this is adopted as a quality metric, we will see more patients extubated early after infant heart surgery so that they can look like this. I thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Susan. Uh, Dr. Zanai, are you going to uh, take over from this point? Yeah, can you hear me now? And thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> thank you, Vivian, for your kind presentation. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce the next speaker, Dr. James DiNardo. He's the chief of division of cardiac anesthesia at Boston Children's Hospital. He is the past president of Congenital Cardiac Anesthesia Society and professor of anesthesia at Harvard Medical School. He will tell us about the importance of patients' hands off. Dr. Dinardo, please. You can share the screen. Jim, you need to unmute. You're still muted. There we go, sorry. Thank you for that um, nice introduction. I'm going to um, be talking about a process that um, is essential to all good um, pediatric cardiac surgical programs. It's one that requires a lot of work um, because it's very easy for programs to backslide on their handoff processes. Uh, and as someone who works in both the OR and the operating and the uh, ICU, obviously I have a little bit of a vested interest in how this works. So um, to start with, um, the idea of handoffs is not a new one. Um, many of you are familiar with this article. This is one of the um, first very good descriptions of the patient handoff process where the um, group from St. Ormond Street uh, looked at two types of high performance teams. They looked at Formula One uh, race teams where um, you have a crew of people who uh, change four tires and fill a gas tank with a very volatile gas mixture in seven seconds. 
Um, that obviously requires unbelievable teamwork. Um, unfortunately, that um, kind of a um, process is not really what we do in medicine. Um, in that in a Formula One team, there's the lollipop man who coordinates the whole procedure, but no one else talks to each other and no one else is paying attention to what anyone else is doing. You have one job and one job only. If your job is to change the right front tire, you change the right front tire, regardless of what else is going on. So this group was very smart. They re recognized that um, the aviation model is a very good one, similar in the sense that it's a high complexity environment, um, but it re does require back and forth communication and it does require input from other team members when things start to go wrong. And I would refer to you to this article. We're not gonna spend a lot of time with it, but you can see here, there's some very significant differences. Um, for instance, situational awareness, the lollipop man on a Formula One team called that because he holds up that big sign that looks like a lollipop, um, is the one that's sort of looking over the whole uh, tire changing gas fill, but he's not really getting any feedback from the people that are involved. Um, which is very different than an airplane where if things are starting to go wrong, the pilot uh, needs to get input, which is uh, very much more like um, what we all do when we get a patient sign out in the ICU. So um, the literature here, um, and I, it's always good I get to follow Susan because she's so smart and so good about this stuff. The, the literature here is very similar to the early extubation um, literature in the sense that we intrinsically understand that um, those processes are good, but finding good literature to support that is difficult. And one of the reasons that's difficult in handoffs um, is because it, it requires a kind of analysis that we don't normally do in medicine, which would be, um, industry type flow chart analysis of before and after or segmented regression analysis to really look carefully at whether the initiation of a handoff process uh, changes an endpoint that we're really interested in. But having said that, I would refer you to this article. This is probably the best summary of the available literature um, looking at handoffs. And um, you can see here, it's a, a meta-analysis type study. Um, we won't go through the details, but I, I wanna direct you to, to the conclusions that um, subjected to pretty reasonable analysis, it, this study does suggest that um, implementation of structured handoffs improve the handoff process, specifically respect with respect to process compliance, we're gonna talk a little bit about that, and patient outcomes. In addition to, and which I think is important in terms of working with teams, um, provider satisfaction. That is that the people who are handing off the patient and the patient, people who are receiving the patient feel better about the whole process when it's structured. So let's talk about what that means. Um, here's an example of a standardized, um, operating room to intensive care protocol. What I would say about this um, is one size doesn't fit all. These need to be developed specifically um, for each institution given the uh, dynamic and the um, um, workflow that occurs, but the, but the components are the same. And um, I'd like to focus on the side on the right, which is that um, you have an ICU team waiting for a lot arrival. Um, the room is prepared. That seems like a simple thing, um, but that is an area um, where backsliding can occur and where the handoff can um, start to fall apart. And by that, I mean, if you have a patient coming from the operating room and you know they have intracardiac lines and an arterial line, um, there's no reason that when you arrive in the ICU that the pressure modules and cables for those transducers 
shouldn't be in the room and have been previously tested. That's a very simple thing to do. Um, when it doesn't happen, it disrupts the handoff process. Um, but that's one of those things that groups um, have to work on um, when they um, review their handoff process to prevent that kind of backsliding. Uh, the other important part is people need to be quiet uh, and respectful so that um, the person that's talking has everyone's attention. Um, it needs to be clear that somebody, and in most um, places that's the anesthesia team since they're most familiar with the patient at that particular point in time, um, is still managing the patient's hemodynamics. This is particularly important if you have a unstable patient, um, that someone is managing the patient while the handoff process is going on. And then there needs to be an, a checklist and whether that's one that um, is printed and gone down uh, step by step or whether people memorize it is really not so relevant. It's just important that all the material be presented. Here's an example of a checklist. Um, at our particular institution, we don't have a written checklist, but this is the kind of information that would be transmitted. Um, by on, on the um, left-hand side, you see by the cardiac surgeon and on the right-hand side by the anesthesia group. Um, one of my um, pet peeves, if you will, uh, is that an area that is not commonly um, carefully discussed with the ICU group is the nuances of the bypass run. Um, the surgeon uh, generally reports um, the um, 10,000 foot view of the bypass run. But if you're the anesthesiologist and you know, you've noticed that during the entire bypass run that the IVC drainage has been a struggle and the perfusionist has been adding volume to compensate for that. Um, that's important information for the ICU team that may be lost. Uh, and we in our institution have had more than one example over the many years I've been there where a patient um, has suffered low grade um, hepatic injury postoperatively that in retrospect um, would have been anticipated if we had recognized that um, we had been dealing with poor IVC drainage the entire case. So I think that's one area that people um, should remember is important. Um, the other thing, um, the issues that need to come across um, to the ICU team by the people who are signing out are the nuances of the patient's vulnerabilities. And it's not so important whether the surgeon describes the residual lesions or they're um, re-emphasized by the anesthesia team, um, but that is one of the vulnerabilities that need to be clearly communicated. The monitoring vulnerabilities need to be communicated. And by that, I mean, if there's been an arterial line in place that hasn't worked very well, um, it needs to be made clear that that's an issue. Um, and it may uh, influence how that um, uh, monitoring modality is um, interpreted in the ICU. Obviously, dysrhythmias, um, a um, clear and unbiased assessment of bleeding. Uh, and by that, I mean um, a clear assessment as to whether um, we believe that it's, uh, there are residual potential um, surgical bleeding sites or that um, it's primarily a medical bleeding issue because of the inability to keep up with blood loss. Um, the um, nuances of pulmonary gas exchange. Uh, and by that, I mean emphasizing, for instance, that a, a baby with a um, complete AV canal uh, repair, a good repair, um, has a very wide a, um, AO2 gradient in the operating room post bypass indicating that there may be residual uh, pulmonary edema or impaired gas exchange, which will um, have some influence on the way the ICU handles the patient. 
And the other is um, hemodynamic vulnerabilities. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, so when you look at what the ICU team is prevented, presented with is once they get a handle on um, the overall picture of the patient, they need to then leverage um, these various considerations, sedation analgesia, ventilation management, metabolic derangements, and hemodynamic management um, to match the patient's trajectory. And by that, I mean, um, as an example, if you have a child who's had significant LV outflow tract obstruction and significant LVH, who has had a successful relief of their LV alpha tract obstruction. And the goal is to move them quickly along towards extubation. Um, the ICU team is gonna to wanna to recognize that um, rigorous control of blood pressure in that patient um, to um, match the surgical um, considerations regarding blood pressure control are um, not gonna be well handled by using large doses of sedation and analgesia if the goal is to get the patient uh, extubated quickly. Um, they're, gonna, they're going to be, the balance is gonna to shift towards use of vasodilators and um, uh, beta antagonistic agents uh, to control blood pressure in a patient like that than they would be in a patient in whom um, you anticipate that the period of intubation might be longer. Um, so to summarize, um, I think the goal really of the handoff team is to help the ICU um, do what they do best, which is define the ultimate trajectory of the patient, which will allow them then to make intelligent decisions about things like sedation and analgesia, uh, ventilation management and hemodynamic management. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Dr. Dinardo. Excellent talk. Very, very clear messages. So Vivian, do you want to launch the poll, the next poll? We're gonna do, I think, two of them for the sake of time. We're not gonna do all of them. We'll do a couple. Uh, Grace, do you mind launching the first one? Since we have talked about ERAS, uh, Jim, do you mind stop sharing your slides? Uh, since we talked about ERAS and immediate extubation, we had a couple of questions about how many programs uh, have ERAS programs uh, that are participating today with the webinar. And you can answer by yes or no, just by pressing on the answer. Could you, uh, could you clarify exactly what that abbreviation is for, just in case some people are unfamiliar? Yeah. Sure, thanks, Gil. It's Enhanced Recovery Programs. Okay, so we have 30%, which is the 70% uh, don't have one. The second question is about extubation and just to have an idea how many people extubate their neonates uh, following cardiac surgery in the OR. Obviously everyone, hopefully will get extubated. The, uh, the question is in the operating room. <laughs> Okay, so 15% so, uh, extubate the neonates in the uh, operating room. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, I think for the sake of time, we're not gonna do more polls. We're gonna move ahead with our third uh, session. And Gail, I think you are up for this one. Yes, I'm, I'm ready to go. It's really a, a privilege for me to introduce Lake at Children's National Hospital in Washington, DC. Uh, Nina is an associate professor of anesthesia and director of the cardiac anesthesia program here and nationally. She is the president-elect of the Society for Pediatric Anesthesia. She's conducted both uh, clinical and education-based uh, research studies, in particular with DEX, uh, and uh, is a, a dear friend and an excellent anesthesiologist. And I've been lucky, very fortunate to work with so many great people on this panel, and I'm really pleased to introduce Nina Deutsch. Thank you so much. Um, I want to 
make sure that everyone can see the screen. Um, I really appreciate the introduction. And um, what I'm gonna talk about today is uh, the cath lab and combined MRI cath lab experience that we've had at Children's National, which I think is gonna be, become a bigger part of the, um, of the care going forward. Um, so let me just, I have no disclosures. And so what we'll do is we'll, first of all, we'll just talk very briefly about the indications for combined MRI right heart cath. And then we'll um, describe the, uh, what the actual process is, the equipment that's involved and the workflow. And then kind of talk briefly about the anesthetic implications of combined MRI right heart cath. And so th the first question we have to ask is why are we changing? Why are we going to this new system? So I think within the medical community, there's definitely been go an ongoing initiative to try to decrease the amount of ionizing radiation that we are exposing our patients to. And while the actual risk of radiation injury remains controversial, I would say that even low level exposure to ionizing radiation is thought to contribute to the long-term risk of malignancy. And children are definitely considered at higher risk. They are more sensitive to radiation with a three to four times greater sensitivity than adults. They have more rap, yeah. I don't know if your slides are advancing. Have you been oh, advancing? okay. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. Is that working? That's perfect, thank you. Okay. Um, women, uh, or sorry, adults um, have uh, uh, less sensitivity than children. They, um, the kids also have more rapidly dividing cells and they are going to live longer to experience radiation toxicity over a longer period of time. And then also when we look at our calf, um, uh, our calf kit procedures, the, um, the children that require cardiac catheterization are definitely having longer procedures and they often undergo multiple procedures over the course of their lifetime. So they definitely have the potential to be at higher risk. Um, when we, um, for, so why change? So um, the other thing to look at here is definitely the benefits of MRI. And MRI has so much better uh, imaging. They can do volumetric analysis of cardiac function, flow measurements. There's uh, better accounting for intracardiac shunts. So you don't have to rely on the FIG principle in order to get these, in, these measurements. They can tell you a lot about RV size and function as well as valvar regurgitation. They can detect fibrosis and edema in the soft tissues, which you really can't see in the calf, um, the calf images. And they are definitely more accurate for PVR calculations. So, and then of course, the big thing is that there's no ionizing radiation. So for all of these reasons, Children's National has built a combined MRI cardiac catheterization combined suite with MRI. And this is in conjunction with, uh, with work that's going on at the NIH and um, is being led by Drs. Laura Oliveri and Dr. Russell Cross here at Children's National through NIH grant funding. And they've really done an outstanding job and outstanding work to make this Work And I'll show you that my title was like the nightmare versus the dream. And I see, I'm going to try to convince you that it actually, once you get the hang of this, it's actually a dream and it really gives us a ton of information. So before we get into the details of the procedure itself, let's look at who's eligible for this. So truly anybody that can be included would be anybody that is um, referred for cardiac catheterization. There are some people that are gonna be excluded. So if you're cardiovascularly unstable, it's not realistic to think that you're gonna be able to manage them in the environment of an MRI. Um, if they are pregnant or if they have any kind of contraindications to MRI scanning, such as uh, indwelling devices, such as a pacemaker or ICD, cochlear implants or an insulin pump, if they have any type of other metal in their body. And then there's also going to be issues with the size of the catheters that are available and the way they have to do the catheter visualization on MRI right now is that they are gadolinium filled catheters that allow for you to visualize that. And I'll show a video in a couple of minutes of what that looks like. 
Um, this is an older slide with respect to our actual numbers itself, but I think it gives an idea of the types of patients that we're doing for these procedures. So the vast majority are going to be um, undergoing myocardial biopsy, or um, they're going to be you're going to be doing uh, coronary angiography. We've also done it for ASD and PDA device closure to get the right heart cath me measurements before the actual device closure is done. So this is a picture of our uh, suite, and you can see here that there is uh, the cardiac catheterization lab here. Their uh, MRI suite is back here, and then there's a kind of a train track type mechanism that allows for transfer between the two rooms. And um, they, it is biplane fluoro, so we actually use this room just for cardiac catheterization as well when we're not um, doing the combined procedures. And then there's large metal doors between the two suites so that when we're not doing combined procedures, people can be having cardiac MRIs on one side and the cardiac catheterization can be going on on the other side. Um, so for with respect to equipment, we obviously know, need some different equipment in order to do this. Here's a brief summary of them and I'll go into them in a little bit more detail. So this is the... Um, real-time MRI user interface. And here you can see that these are the pictures of the MRI in um, two different views. And you will follow that you'll be able to follow the catheters up through the um, that are being placed in order to see where things are going. And it's done in real time. So they will be uh, actually uh, getting images while the catheters are moving. The second thing is that there's a pretty uh, involved uh, data display. So here they have uh, all of the hemodynamic monitoring that's available. And then you have the real-time interface that was on the previous slide, as well as other vital signs here from our, um, from our monitor that the, um, op the uh, people that are doing the um, procedure can see. Um, this is kind of a snapshot of what it looks like when we're doing the procedure. So here are the two interventional cardiologists. The MRI is completely draped because, of course, this is a sterile procedure. Here's the interactive screen. Um, we use uh, noise-canceling headsets in order for everybody to be able to speak to one another because, obviously, the MRI can be loud. And back here in the little itty-bitty corner, this is where the anesthesiologist stands um, and we're also present in the room during the procedure. Um, so this is a movie and I'm gonna go ahead and play it through. Um, and you will see that the catheter is gonna enter the body. Um, it's gonna, there's the catheter. It's this little dot right here. It's gonna move back and forth and eventually go across the right atrium, across the tricuspid valve and into the right ventricle. And then it'll eventually go out into the RVOT. Um, when you see that happens, then it, here you're going to see that the imaging speeds up and this, this little dot that is moving back and forth is actually the catheter. And like I said, the balloon is filled with gadolinium and so it allows for them to see the balloon because currently there's nothing that's MRI compatible with respect to catheters that allows for this to be done otherwise. And there are obviously studies going on to, to try to um, fix that issue. Um, and um, so basically they can follow the catheter throughout. Um, this is another video and I'm just gonna let this continually play on loop while I talk about what goes on here. But um, basically um, the patient's brought into the catheterization suite. Um, we induce anesthesia, we intubate, the patient's draped and, draped and prepped in the normal fashion um, like you would for a standard catheterization. The interventionalists get groin access, the sheaths are sutured in place, and then all metal is removed from the table and the sterile drapes are kind of folded in on the patient. And you can see then that the, um, we move the, we open the doors and move into the MRI suite. So, um, so that's kind of the wrap up. Everyone moves into the MRI suite. We do this procedure on that side. And then when we're all done, we bring the patient back into the cardiac catheterization suite. And um, uh, once the right heart catheterization and everything is done, if they need to say close an ASD or something like that, or take myocardial biopsies, then that's done in the cath suite and then we're done. 
So when you look at the workflow, this actually does add time. Um, we have about 10 minutes for groin access, and then there is about 30 minutes of localized scanning. This time, this amount of time, typically, um, it can be more or less depending on what they're looking at. They take about five minutes to do planning, confirm that they're all happy with the images, and then the right heart catheterization really doesn't take any longer than normal. Um, there's obviously time with the transfers, and we um, have a little bit of time for research because this is being done through NIH funding for research for the future. So the right heart catheterization time does take a bit longer. I will say that as we've gotten more used to this and, and better at it, it's, it's actually gone quicker and quicker. So what are the anesthetic implications? Well, obviously there's gonna be a lot of issues with respect to uh, equipment, um, as we talked about, you have to have everything in the MRI suite because you can't really leave once it's once the, uh, the uh, scans have started. And so um, I, we basically take everything that we think we're going to need into there. And of course, it has to be MRI safe. The other thing, of course, is that it's you're uh, nesthetizing a patient that's in an MRI scanner in a bore. And so you have to have extensions on all of your equipment in order, and you're going to pre have pretty limited access to the patients as well. Um, one of the most important things is that we realized is um, very early on is that there really had to be planning ahead of time. And so everyone is assigned roles. And we have um, different uh, uh, safety uh, uh, simulations in order to figure out what the role is of each person. So, you know, things that you don't even think about in the regular operating room. If we had an emergency and we needed to come out of the MRI, what's the fastest way to release the MRI table, open the doors and get back into the catheterization suite where we could defibrillate, say. And so we were able to assign roles to every single person. And we do have these safety drills that are done regularly, at least quarterly. And with that, we found little things that have really uh, made a huge difference and increased our safety as well as increased our um, effectiveness. And, um, and we have a paper that's gonna be coming out on that soon. Um, so when you are looking at this, we start the day with a team huddle where we talk about the procedure itself. We make sure that everyone knows their roles. And this is literally like a five minute thing at this point because we've gotten um, this down to a science almost. We induce, like I said. We then do a timeout and a metal screen um, because uh, it's, it's always interesting that little things can sneak back into the room that you don't think about because it's just not... Um, your norm, whereas when you always work in MRI for just scanning, it's, it's part of your everyday practice. Um, so uh, the sheets are sutured in place, we do a second metal scan, and then we go into the cath lab. The patient is transferred on the table, and, and the, really the anesthesiologists are the only ones that move between the two rooms, otherwise everyone has to go around, and that makes sure that there's no, again, metal or un unnecessary equipment being brought into the room. Um, they get the baseline MRI imaging, the bright heart cath is performed, we move back out of the scanner, anything else is done, and, uh, and then we're finished. So what do we have to look forward to in the future? Well, I think that uh, electrophysiology is probably in our future. I think most of us are doing uh, EP studies with no radiation at this point with uh, the mapping and the availability, availabilities that that has. But MRI can actually really give good indications about um, where areas for ablation and um, prior ablation sites, et cetera. And so I think that this is on our horizon. And not that I want anything to add to the length of an, an uh, EP study, but, um, but I think that this is another area for future um, study and certainly has already started here. And I just want to thank the team that's involved in this. It's uh, like I said, it's led by Dr. Laura Oliveri and Dr. Russell Cross, and they have really um, embraced the entire team, including the anesthesia team, to make these, these uh, procedures go off without a hitch. And I have some references there for people for later. And I thank you for your time. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Thanks so much, Nina. 
Uh, that's terrific. I really do appreciate that there are still almost 500 people who stayed with us this entire time. It's a real tribute to the faculty, I must say. Um, and the final speaker for today is uh, the person who put all this together, Dr. Vivian Nasser, who's an associate uh, professor of anesthesia up at Harvard uh, Medical School in Boston's Children's, and she's been particularly interested in the perioperative uh, risk assessment of children. She's widely published and is on the board of director of the Congenital Cardiac Anesthesia Society. Vivian. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Sasha and, every, and Grace and everyone who helped put all this together from the Congenital Heart Academy in collaboration with the uh, uh, Cardiac Anesthesia Society. I'm, I mean, I'm going to be talking about my patient now that we have talked about these patients with congenital heart disease for surgery, for cath lab. Uh, now we're going to talk about them coming for a non-cardiac procedure. And what is the risk? Uh, I have no disclosures. I'm going to describe for the first part of it, uh, these patients with congenital heart disease, why they are a high risk population, and then review some of the literature on risk stratification. I have to uh, mention that the most of the publications that I'm going to mention that I have worked on uh, with two of the speakers today, Dr. Ferroni and Dr. DiNardo. So when we talk about the risk, what is the risk? We're really measuring a probability. It's a statistical chance of a an occurrence. Usually it's un, uh, undesirable because we're calling it a risk. We think about it every day. Uh, we, weigh, we weigh every day the risk benefit every time we uh, decide to anesthetize a patient. Even for the cardiologist on the, on the webinar today, you weigh the risk and benefit of sending your patient for surgery or for a cath lab as well. So it, there is different perspective of how we think about risk. Is it the patient thinking about the risk of staying overnight? Is it us thinking about the risk of mortality of the patient or even hospital management or insurance companies? So if we think about the risk, we think about it about five Ds, I call them, of outcomes and risk of death, of disease, of discomfort, disability or dissatisfaction. And maybe in, since we're at worldwide webinar, some places uh, unlike others might be also concerned with the risk of dollars and expenses. Uh, I'm gonna focus mostly on the risk of death and uh, the risk will have different uh, contributing factors, patient's condition, acute or chronic, the surgical procedure, or even the provider taking care of the patient or the hospital, the volume of the hospital. So why are these patients a high risk population? And there is literature, you can see going back to 2000, knowing that patients with congenital heart disease are at a higher risk of mortality after a non-cardiac procedure than patients without a cardiac disease. You can see that there are twofold increase in mortality. They have 88% of patients who experienced cardiac arrest had a congenital heart disease, and 50% of cases with mortality involves patients with pulmonary hypertension. And you can see the dates on these publications from 2000, 2007, 2011. And then we have the major paper, Pediatric Perioperative Cardiac Arrest Registry, and looking at 373 anesthesia-related cardiac arrests and have shown that really 34% of these cases has a congenital or acquired heart disease, and they were almost 50% in infants, 70% uh, in less than two years, 50% are in the general OR. You can see that the cardiac OR and cath lab have the incidence of less. The most common lesion are patients with single ventricle. So why are we really concerned with these high-risk population? A recent query that uh, we've done as part of our research looking at the Pediatric Health Information System database, which is a database in the US, including around 52 children's hospital. And you can see that the number have increased in the past five years, almost by 20%. We were at 38,000 non-cardiac procedures. Now we do 45,000, for almost 46,000 cardiac, uh, non-cardiac procedure on these patients with congenital heart disease. The good thing is that you can see this orange line, which de determines the mortality mortality uh, is a little bit declining and it's going down to around 1% 1, 1 in uh, mortality. But if you compare it to the same patients that are non-cardiac, non-congenital heart disease patients that are undergoing this procedure, their mortality rate is 0.12%. 
In fact, Dr. Ferroni and Dr. DiNardo had looked at the post-operative outcome in children with and without congenital heart disease, comparing mortality, comparing reintubation. And you can see that uh, here you have the major and severe CHD in blue and orange. And what I mean by major and severe CHD, major is a repaired CHD that has still a residual hemodynamic instability. And a severe CHD is an uncorrected cyanotic heart disease or pulmonary hypertension. And you can see that the risk of mortality or risk of reintubation uh, is higher in patients with major and severe CHD. So when I'm going to look at this diagram, I want to think about what is the patient's condition that makes them at higher risk, and then think about what surgery they're doing and the providers. So this is our institutional data uh, done uh, 3,000 cardiac patients that underwent a non-cardiac procedure over a five-year period. And the incidence of cardiovascular events were 11.5%, and the incidence of respiratory uh, events were 4.7%. And the way the cardiovascular events are defined by inotropic use, cardiac arrest, uh, pulmonary hypertension crisis, or arrhythmia. And then the factors that are uh, prominent here, you can see that major and severe CHD, similarly as we described earlier, and single ventricle are really major variables in predicting that they're going to have a respiratory or a cardiovascular event. So working with the, with the team, we wanted to develop a risk score that looked at these patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery. And we used the National Surgical Quality Improvement Database uh, that has around 127 participating hospitals. And you can see here, we included, the, uh, we did a derivation and a validation cohort. And you can see these are the scores. And the score is formed by these variables. So if a patient has an emergency procedure, severe CHD, single ventricle physiology, inotropic support, pre-op, CPR, kidney injury, mechanical ventilation. So you add up any of those factors and you will have a score that ranges here from one up. And you can see that the patients less than three have an odds ratio of 1.54 risk of mortality. And patients above seven have a higher risk that continues to uh, increase. And it's an odds ratio of 22.15. So the higher your, uh, the more components of these variables you have, you obviously have a higher risk of mortality. So talking about the patient condition, as I mentioned, the kidney disease, the pre-op CPR, pre-op mechanical ventilation. But then if they are coming, they're coming for the surgical procedure. So how does the surgical procedure play a role? If I have the same patient going for an arthroscopy, is it the same as if that patient is going for a, um, a spine fusion? So we decided to look at if the surgical themselves have an intrinsic surgical risk. And this is including all patients, not just CHD patients, CHD and non-CHD. And we use the same database looking at CPT codes. What CPT codes is a procedural code. So every surgery has a, a procedural terminology code. And this, uh, there are around 700 codes in that database, 700 different procedures. Uh, and among these cases, we had 0.34% the incidence of mortality. So we categorize these procedure into four uh, uh, risk quartile of mortality. And you can see here on that graph, if the patient has number of morbidities increases, your risk of mortality does increase. Now this line is for patients who are having a higher surgical risk procedure. This is for a low surgical risk procedure. And so if that same patient with the five comorbidities undergoing a low surgical procedure, your risk is 4.7% compared if you're getting a high risk surgical procedure, which makes it 46.7%. To clarify what I mean by surgical risk here, the range of 30 day mortality risk quartile of one for those procedures, 0%, risk quartile four was 1.15%. And a few examples of procedure in the first quartile would be like arthroscopy or a simple ear procedure. Risk quartile four would include a hepatectomy, risk quartile three would include a spine fusion. So what I'm trying to say is that you have a patient's condition, but you also have the surgery that the patient is doing that might play a role. So to try to understand that in our congenital heart disease patient, we tried to look at this intrinsic surgical risk and see just in our interest, subset of interest, which is the patient with congenital heart disease, how does that play a role? So we had 37,000 children with CHD that are undergoing non-cardiac with an overall mortality of 1.7%. 
and you can see earlier, the mortality of all patients was only 0.34%. And you can see here when we do the risk stratification score, unrepaired CHD and severe CHD are important factor, but you can see that the intrinsic surgical risk now has a plus zero. So really the surgery itself did not play much of a role in patients with CHD. And in fact, in this graph, you can see that your risk stratification as you go higher, no matter what you have, a low or a high surgical risk as determined here in these, your risk of mortality are very similar and it is mostly dependent on your CHD risk stratification. So what we are trying to say here is that the functional status of the cardiac lesion might play a, better, a bigger role in patients when they're on, uh, cardiac patients undergoing a surgical procedure. So what is the next step? I talked to you about the patient's condition. I talked about the surgical procedure. Really, if we're going to think about these CHD, I think it's a different bubble here. We have to add a cardiac function by itself that will include residual lesions or maybe the specific uh, le a cardiac lesion that the patient have. And I put a question mark next to it. Sometimes there is a question if depends on the provider or does the hospital volume plays a role. And so the in red are questions that remain to be answered here. And so the future is for us really to look at these cardiac function and cardiac lesions. And we've used so far large databases that might not have that granularity. What is the role of the provider and the institution? And so at this time, for a multi-institutional study maybe where we can accumulate granular data focusing on these congenital heart disease patients coming for non-cardiac procedure. Thank you for listening to this talk and for staying for the whole webinar. I would like to present to you the next annual meeting of the Congenital Cardiac Anesthesia Society that's gonna happen in 2021. It's gonna be in February uh, 25th in the San Diego, California. And it will be chaired by Dr. Nicholson, whom you've met earlier during the webinar today. Thank you all for listening and for staying throughout. Thank you very much, Dr. Nasser. Um, I don't know if Dr. Agati or Dr. Van Leeuwen have any uh, final comments or anything else to put into the uh, chat box. Thanks, uh, no comments. Uh, I'm, very, I'm very happy because uh, I, I think that the point that we treat was uh, useful for mostly of the people who are following us. I'm very surprised because uh, from the first the starting minute, we have 500 people and more or less we reach 600. So it's a compliment for the people who's uh, prepared the program for the speakers. And uh, every time is uh, this uh, the, the, the sense and it makes the success. We fight with Gil sometimes about the speaker and the topics, but I think that this uh, meeting yeah. was uh, really amazing. He never fights Sasha. <laughs> this, 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 yeah. Discuss ideas. That's what we do. We discuss ideas. <laughs> and we're open to those ideas, right? If people have ideas, we really are. I mean, that's what's going to make these particularly helpful. So. And everybody, thank you very, very much. Uh, we are going to email you with all the information about our next activities. And then we have in the chat the links as well, but we are going to email all of you uh, about that. So we hope to see you next Monday, next Tuesday, next Thursday, and next Friday. And we are very happy to have all of you. Thank you, the speakers. Thank you, Viviani. It was really amazing. I've learned a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. All. Thank you. Thanks. We're going to keep the meeting open so people can go into the chat box. Uh, they can either put in comments there uh, or get some of the links. And thanks everyone for attending from uh, Australia all the way to the west coast of the U.S. Amazing. Bye bye, guys. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Grace, do you, did you make the picture? Where is Grace? Or yes. I made a picture in the beginning. It was very, very nice. I'm Thank going to send it to all of you. Yes, I will, I will. Don't worry. Uh, I took some pictures during the webinars as well with the most important slides. And we have a very uh, active people on social media. So all the talks were tweeted on Twitter. And so all the speakers can see what people were thinking about their, their talks. And, uh, and the feedback so far has been already amazing. We are very happy for that. 
and uh, we are going to share with all of you the link of the on YouTube so you can send this talk to whoever you think would uh, benefit from from seeing that so anytime it's going to be on YouTube so people can see it and see again okay Great to see you, but uh, especially my, Susan, it's really terrific to see you. It's been way too long. So thanks again for your time and putting all the effort into those slides. Great to see you too, Gil. Sorry, I had to show those pictures. There was really not much, <laughs> nothing else I could do about that. Well, paybacks, I have some of you as well. Yes, I'm sure that's true. <laughs> Dr. Susan, you can send it to me. I, I can spread uh, the pictures. Don't worry. Over the whole world. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, guys. Hi, Rosanna. <laughs> you can't talk. No. Can you hear? No. Yes, I can hear you. Really? How is it working? <laughs> so can 250 other people. Yes. It's okay. We're not saying any secrets. We love all of them. <laughs> you are alone. <laughs> we have to say hello to our colleagues from Mauritius, Dr. Ansharas. Join us, Dr. Alex and Dr. Vivian from Tanzania. Hi. Ciao. So Thank you, Vivian. Thank you, guys. That was Thank awesome. You. Bye bye. That was a lot of fun. Bye. We have to think to the next one, huh? For right. sure. I think I, you go enjoy some wine. I'm going to have some lunch. <laughs> Okay. Bye, Vivian. Bye, Rosanna. Bye.